webinar we have on um, on uh, promoting uh, open online learning in the workforce in Europe, a very, very interesting initiative by um, EASMA from the European Commission. And the project leader, project manager for that uh, initiative was uh, Dr. Christina Davogeda from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, EU Services. Uh, we will uh, have one hour to discuss uh, this initiative and to raise some uh, questions and reflections uh, from the presentation. Uh, I am Ebo Janilsson. I am the Eden EC and also uh, the chair of the Eden Special Interest Group of uh, Technology and Able Learning and Quality Enhancement and also in Eden NAP and in Eden uh, uh, Council of Fellows. So it's a great pleasure to have you all here, and it's a great pleasure to organize uh, this uh, webinar on behalf of Eden. Uh, as I said uh, when we were talking uh, before starting, um, the webinar is recording. Uh, you who are here and have registered, you will get uh, an email about the, the link, and you will also get a badge or your participation. Um, during the webinar, um, Christina will share um, the findings about this uh, from this initiative, and the feel free to raise, raise reflections, questions, uh, etc. in the chat. I will myself uh, try to catch up with that, so we can have in the end of the web webinar maybe some 10 to 15 minutes uh, to discuss uh, your ideas and your uh, experiences. So please uh, feel free, free to um, to write whatever in in the chat. Uh, I think I have said uh, everything. Well, uh, one more thing: uh, those webinars are always followed up by an Eden chat uh, later in the evening at six o'clock p.m. Central European time. So we will have an Eden chat. Um, it is uh, with Twitter. And the hashtag was in the also in the email you got for this webinar. So at that chat, you have the possibilities to discuss further on, and I will be there to moderate that uh, session. Okay, thank you, Ferenc. I see that there's a lot of echo from my microphone. Is it better now? Okay. So before I leave the floor to uh, Christina, I will um, say something about Eden. Yes, here you can see see um, uh, the presenters, and as it was announced in the in the call for this webinar, it was uh, also under Richard from the uh, European Commission and EASMA who also are involved in this project, but he had a, a very late uh, cancer because he had to substitute his director just uh, today and just this time. So I've asked Christina to take uh, his part as well about the background. So Eden is the largest uh, active and developing professional community of researchers and practitioners of the open distance and e-learning in Europe. We are a non-profit and non-governmental association, and it was established in 1991. It's a platform for professional cooperation and information exchange. It's open for all levels and sectors of education and training. It's open for institutions, individuals, and networks. And we have our, our legal office in UK, and the Secretariat is in Hungary since 1997. The mission of Eden is to support and divorce to modernize education in Europe, to network and collaborate, facilitate knowledge and practice exchange, improve understanding amongst professionals in distance and e-learning, and promote policy and practices across the area of online learning and e-learning and distance learning. Our members are both from institutions. You can be an individual member. It can be networks. We have some 187 institutional members and some over 1,000 members in the network of academic professionals. 
which is a meeting and communication forum, and we have over 30 European or national networks uh, presented in, in membership. We have 400 plus institutions represented from 70 countries, both within Europe but also from outside Europe. Uh, as I said, one of the special interest groups uh, Eden uh, has since some years is the Eden Special Interest Group on Teaching and Able Learning and Quality Enhancement. And I am myself a share of that um, uh, interest group. And we are some uh, 10 people, um, uh, colleagues uh, actively uh, in the core group. And then um, people who have an interest in, um, in this area are welcome to join. So this webinar is on behalf of this special interest group. And the webinar is also in collaboration with the uh, Eden uh, Network of Academic Professionals, which also is a special network which you are free, free to, to um, contribute with. And they have a special members area, like this web page, web page where people can uh, find colleagues, find projects, find collaborators, etc. And they have also an in, uh, own uh, steering committee. We are hosting uh, annual conferences each uh, year. Uh, the conference in 2020 will be held in Romania, Timisoara. And the topic is about human and artificial intelligence for the society of the future. It will be 21 to 24th June. So welcome to register for that. The call is also open for, for um, contributions. So, with that um, a brief information about uh, Eden, as I said, it's a cooperation with the uh, Eden SIG and the Eden app, and we, of course with uh, Eden as a uh, whole. So, with that, I um, will give the floor to uh, Dr. Christina Debutieda from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, EU Services to present about the initiative and uh, the findings and the recommendations. And um, I will also say that uh, Eden was a partner in this project. So it is a great opportunity uh, to have you here, Christina. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva, for your introduction. And thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to be here and to share the findings and the outcomes and uh, to have this discussion uh, with the audience. And uh, the audience that we have today is a target audience of this initiative. I really hope that uh, there are no any issues with sound. So if there is anything, just let me know. But I'll try and do my best to, for you to be able to, to hear me. And uh, please let me start with just a brief introduction of myself, uh, who I am. Uh, so I'm um, leading PwC Innovation Research Center in the Netherlands and working for PwC EU um, services. Uh, we are doing um, all kinds of assignments for the European Commission and EASMA already for uh, more than uh, 12 years from my side. Uh, and uh, it's mainly in the area of skills, upskilling, reskilling, talent, uh, emerging technologies and skills. So uh, all the uh, new and alternative forms of education and training, artificial intelligence and uh, all the related topics. And uh, in the context of my work, uh, we've uh, carried out lots of different related studies for the European Commission, one of which will be discussed today. And this is this initiative on promoting online training opportunities. That was a two-year initiative, which was just finished um, in the autumn of 2019. And we are actually now actively disseminating the outcomes of this initiative. And the objective of our webinar today is to first for me to introduce to you the key objectives, uh, outcomes, and uh, key uh, results of this initiative, and then specifically to present the key elements of the vision, because that was actually the main target of the initiative, to develop this common vision based on inputs from all key stakeholder groups on how do we uh, make sure that online training is actively promoted among the workforce in Europe. 
But um, for me, the most important point of the webinar of today is actually to discuss with you how can we make sure that the vision is not just staying in the report as it is right now, but is actually transcended into the real life reality, into your own local context. And that together we discuss how do we maximize the impact of those outcomes of the initiative. So in the end, we would like to have this kind of interactive discussion together with you. So please let me just start with a brief introduction of background and objectives uh, of the initiative. And uh, so we were asked by the European Commission, specifically EASMA and Dici Grow, to identify the ways to massively promote online training solutions among companies in Europe and specifically among small businesses in Europe. And how to find this out? We were asked to do extensive desk research. We conducted lots of in-depth interviews to pan-European online surveys. We had multiple expert workshops and our final conference in Brussels uh, in June. And uh, the key outcomes have been formulated in the final report and the brochure which are all already accessible online. So you're all warmly welcome to explore them on the EU publications website, and the link is provided. Uh, these are, especially the final report is quite a long document. And the brochure is more a kind of a uh, appetizer, gives you the main highlights of the outcomes. And uh, today I'll try to guide you through them briefly. So. Um, Let's start with why this topic and why now? Well, I will not surprise you by saying that we live in uh, wonderful times, times of great change, driven not only by all those uh, disruptive technologies like uh, AI, uh, robotics, big data, Internet of Things, and so on, but uh, we also experience lots of social um, challenges, uh, societal challenges, economic challenges, political challenges, which should also not uh, be forgotten. Um, things related to migration, ethical diversity, gender equality, uh, social inclusion, and so on. All those developments inevitably have fundamental implications for skill requirements. And that implies that companies need to work on upskilling and reskilling of the people working there. So we need a new mindset. We need also companies and the company leaders to accept the, this reality that if you do not invest in upskilling or reskilling, then you are out of out of the market very soon. So it's just a matter of time, and this time is running out very quickly. So uh, there is a need for new effective approaches to develop required skills, and uh, this is a quote in the center here, which I really liked. It's also from. Uh, from Eden uh, and from a SADA conference that we had in, in September, uh, that it's not about technology, it's about people. Uh, we often talked about it during our workshops, that um, technology is uh, not the uh, key factor here. Technology is more like a tool, and it's more about how we will be using this technology, what we will be doing with that, and what implications it will have on us people, and that will determine how the future will look like. And now if we zoom into uh, the world of SMEs, uh, small companies, small businesses, uh, according to the European Commission's definition, so under 250 employees, then uh, their world, when we talk about this uh, reskilling, upskilling challenge, is even, even more challenging uh, because uh, they uh, have as well, this ever-growing need for upskilling their tele uh, employees, but they are operating under extreme time pressure, extreme budget constraints. Uh, they have fierce competition for talent, and always, often they also uh, have this fear to invest in their people because of uh, high retention rate and uh, lots of people uh, actually moving quickly from one place to another. Um, and Next to all that, uh, we have um, factors like frustration and ignorance from the company side, uh, with frustration being um, represented by the fact that uh, we talked with lots of representatives of small companies, and they say, 
we would love to do something about that in terms of upskilling and reskilling, but we have no idea literally where to go. It's an ocean of opportunities, lots of different platforms, tools, trainings. Where should we go? What should we do? How should we organize it? Uh, there is, on the other side, another group of small companies we talk to, um, which demonstrate a huge level of ignorance, uh, which uh, usually these are not uh, high-tech companies, but more traditional sectors, which say, yeah, we, we've been doing this business like this for like for decades already, and it's going to be fine. We don't need to bother, and all those digital things, It's, it's we, we really do not care, and our business seems to be perfectly okay. Well, uh, it's it's a big question to what extent this is a sustainable perspective. On the other hand, uh, when we talk about all these upskilling and reskilling challenges, we have such a wonderful thing as online training. And uh, of course, I don't have to tell you about all the benefits uh, that it brings, like flexibility, cost effectiveness, learning, in, uh, learner engagement, innovative uh, pedagogies, better reach, uh, scalability, and so on. Uh, and I have to emphasize here, uh, we do not try to proclaim online training as the only way of organizing learning in this digital age, but it's uh, it's a promising and highly relevant uh, kind of uh, solution that we should definitely consider and what which companies should be aware about uh, when uh, they deal with these reskilling and upskilling challenges. And I also wanted to make sure that uh, we are all on the same page when we talk about uh, online training. What do I actually mean by that? So here we've put the definition that we used in our study. And uh, in its essence, it's literally, uh, or it's basically, uh, we talk about training that is delivered, enabled, or mediated using digital technology uh, for the explicit purpose of learning on organizations. Actually, you could say that we're talking here about digital learning. So we're not talking explicitly about training. It's learning, more general approach, and online yeah, it can be also offline if it's digital. We're talking here about digital learning, but even further than that, and here in purple we've highlighted this kind of a mindset shift that we wanted to emphasize throughout the report, that we actually need to uh, shift from digital learning idea towards the idea of learning in a digital world. And let me explain what I mean by that. When we talk about digital learning, we kind of say, well, you can learn in all different ways, but you can actually use digital tools and we can digitalize the way we learn. So let's put it like digital learning. So that's the term. And learning in a digital world actually emphasizes that the world itself is becoming so digital that it's almost impossible to distinguish anymore between digital and non-digital learning and it doesn't make a lot of sense so that because learning itself becomes part of this digital world so let's just talk about learning in a digital world that's the difference I wanted to emphasize but despite all those great challenges and promises that online training offers uh, to small companies a reality shows that uh, the adoption rates of online training solutions by European companies, and especially we're talking now about small companies, happens at an unacceptably slow rate, which was the problem that was uh, actually found by the European Commission and was the very reason why uh, this study was launched. And uh, why do we say that the um, um, adoption rates are unacceptably low? Well, here is the graph that we developed based on um, data from uh, PIAC database on the uh, participation rates in open or distance education in SMEs in different countries. And uh, in red, you see, or in dark orange, you see uh, companies who responded yes, and in yellow, no. So uh, there is a still relatively low proportion of companies. Uh, by the way, we have also made a split between different sizes within SMEs. So starting from less than 10 people and then up to 50 and 250. But you can see that the rates are quite low here. And uh, some countries that are popping up are uh, Spain, Finland, Sweden, uh, Poland. So Lithuania, so these are examples. But for the rest, uh, in in most countries, it's really slow. And even in those countries where it's higher than in others, it's still not very high. 
I have to say that the data we are showing here is already quite outdated. And it's an, a big challenge for us as researchers to work with such analysis and or databases because the time lag of, from the moment when you get this data till the moment that you can actually analyze this data is an extreme extreme gap. For example, here uh, we were doing this analysis in 2019 and uh, the data we had to work with from these countries was from 2012 to 2015. So you see the difference in some countries, almost seven years of difference uh, of, of measuring moments, which is quite insane and it certainly does not reflect the current situation. But let's hope that these databases are showing this type of data will be moving more and more towards real life data reflections uh, in the future that we, which will allow us researchers also to work with the most actual data. Nevertheless, uh, we talked to companies in terms of uh, checking whether this is a, a realistic picture of this type of data and they pretty much confirmed that the situation has not drastically changed since that moment. So our study was still needed. And before you can solve something, you need to understand why it is like this. So our first step was actually we needed to figure out what was the key reason why are the adoption rates of those digital learning or online training solutions in small companies was so low, which we did by means of in-depth interviews and online surveys and uh, across Europe. And uh, here you can see a list um, of all kinds of reasons and barriers. So it's not like only one thing why uh, the adoption rates are so low. But uh, if we have to prioritize, we could still uh, clearly see that the most popular reason why was this lack of the overall culture of learning in companies. So learning was not and in many companies is still not a major part of the agenda. It's not considered to be something to uh, be treating in a formal way. Uh, in many companies, they do learn. It's not like they completely ignore it, but uh, it's not seen as something special or something which needs to be formalized, be a kind of part of company's culture. It's just, yeah, we do learning sometimes and then that's it, but we never bother whether it's uh, like a strategic choice or not. We just do it whenever we need it and then we forget about, uh, you know, some kind of more flexible attitude, but not an established kind of this culture where it's inspired or encouraged or where people inspire each other, where leaders support it, where people get recognized for it, or where there are some specific tools, approaches, or things like that, which would form a more kind of a culture of there. Uh, but of course, there were also other reasons which we needed to uh, take a look at. and in any case, this pre-analysis supported our initial hypothesis that something needs to be done about it. And we were asked by the Commission to explore what exactly needs to be done and by whom, but also how should the funding be organized and how should online training complement other traditional forms of training. That's what I tried to emphasize from the beginning, that we should not promote it as the only way of doing training in the new world, right? Because there are still also promising areas where physical training is needed, but also where learning on the job, real-time um, learning is needed, and so on. And uh, what are the most promising ways of reaching out to the workforce to engage them into online training? And that's where I would like also to mention um, what Andre Richet, so or ever kindly mentioned Mr. Andre Richet, he's coordinating this initiative from uh, DigiGrow of the European Commission. So what he uh, asked me also to convey uh, during this webinar, uh, that this online training initiative uh, forms part of a series of initiatives uh, under the um, uh, strategic uh, initiative of the European Commission. Uh, skills for industry um, and uh, there are some other parallel initiatives that look for example at curricular guidelines uh, for engineers of the future including also online training measures or a new funding mechanisms explicitly for stimulating uh, upskilling and reskilling initiatives or the overall EU skills strategy for 2030. 
Um, all those initiatives that are carried out by the European Commission, they aim to generate input for the new Commission, so because they were launched by, by the old Commission and now uh, they are all delivering inputs for the new Commission to take over and uh, to uh, develop these new programs for the future based on stakeholder inputs. And the key uh, way for us to gather answers to these questions was to go to people, to the field, to users, to providers, to providers of education and training, uh, to policymakers themselves, but to supporting structures, networks, communities, and um, associations, and to ask them to provide their views, vision, ideas, suggestions to those questions that we had to answer. So it wasn't our own opinion, but it was a consolidation of lots of consultations with people from the field from across Europe. All right, so I'm now moving on to the key outcomes. And I already mentioned to you that the report is in itself already uh, available on the EU publications website. And during this webinar, I would like to only to focus on the very last point of this report, which is a uh, vision and top priority measures and overall recommendations. But uh, you see that there is a whole list of other bullet points uh, which were covered in the reports quite extensively. So if you're interested in those, you're warmly welcome to explore the report in detail. Uh, if we have to summarize the key outcomes first, uh, it's just um, to say that uh, so far, when we talk about specific measures, initiatives, and so on, of what needs to be done. So now we are also already in the area of uh, solutions. We were talking about challenges. Now we're moving already to solutions that we found. So, uh, so far, before we did this um, study, um, the initiatives, measures, programs that were aiming to change the situation, uh, they were mainly supply-oriented very often. So they tried to make online training more attractive, to make supply bigger, better, to, to develop new platforms, to support uh, developers of online training solutions, and so on. While uh, during this research, we concluded that uh, there is actually a need also, not uh, also, but actually for a shift from a supply-oriented approach towards a demand-oriented initiatives which implies that we need to put our users in the center because that could be also the very answer to the problem, why the adoption rates are so low. So we need to make sure that our users are put in the center of the situation, that uh, the training uh, solutions are developed for them, with them, and are relevant to what they are doing and tailored to their very uh, context in which they are operating. And that actually relates to all the specific conditions for a massive take-up of online training, that we talk about the user in the center, and of course, the, uh, the providers, the supply of online training is extremely important, and it is extremely important to have high quality and good providers, but it should be more uh, structured around the user rather than around the supplier. So now we are entering the vision itself. Um, uh, the objective for us was to develop an overall blueprint of what kind of measures, roles, priorities would be needed at the EU and national levels in 2021, 2027 and beyond. So actually who has to do what to make sure that uh, the online training solutions are successfully adopted uh, massively. Uh, within Europe and especially by small companies. So that's what we did. And what I mentioned already that we had to do this based on inputs from all kinds of stakeholders. I uh, will recall them again. So these are users themselves, providers of um, training solutions themselves, uh, so education and training providers, policy makers, uh, supporting structures, so all kinds of uh, industry associations. Uh, um, cluster organizations and, and so on and the similar structures. 
So it's it's a huge kind of community that we had to mobilize and uh, whom we asked through online surveys, interviews and workshops to submit their inputs. And it, it was our task to make sure that we translate this waterfall of suggestions, um, of course, put it through the assessment framework and develop top priorities. And I can tell you this was a highly challenging exercise because we actually uh, received a waterfall of ideas. Uh, I mean it. So it was just an immense amount of all kinds of views, visions, solutions, ideas at all kinds of levels. And it all demanded a structure. And we wanted to have a structure which has a holistic approach that we do not tackle only one piece of a bigger picture and just that's it, or that we do not have fragments of a bigger picture, but do not see the whole picture. So we desperately needed a framework where we would be able to put all those collected measures. And um, we decided to work with two dimensions. And the first dimension was this framework, um, which is called a habit loop model. And please let me briefly explain to you what I mean here, because it's a fundamental for understanding how the next steps were structured and how the vision looks like. Um, why we chose the habit loop model? The habit loop model uh, basically shows you what needs to be done to change somebody's habit or somebody's behavior. We took it from, it was uh, kindly suggested by Cute Solutions. It's a company in Brussels which is professionally um, changing behaviors of companies. Uh, what are we talking about? Exactly that. You may remember that I mentioned to you that uh, the biggest barrier that we found for adopting online training solutions was this lack of learning culture so there was a need and there is a need for many companies to change their behavior their attitude towards learning and their behavior so this model seemed to be perfectly suitable for that and uh, the model shows that uh, you first need to have a motor uh, before you can start the start it, get it running so to say and the motor here is um, the knowledge of uh, the fact that so there are online training solutions that they do exist and that they can be relevant and useful for my company that's the motor here the trigger is um, something operational like a reason that you need to have uh, to start engaging in online training very many people uh, tend to think that uh, well, it's enough with the motor. If you know that the online training solutions exist and that they're very good, that the company will be using that. Of course, we see that it's absolutely not the case uh, because uh, to start using something, you need a good reason for that. And that's your trigger. Trigger is actually when you work on a project uh, in, in a small company, for example, in this case, and you consider uh, and you see there is a challenge and you understand I need to follow a certain training an online training in this case to solve that problem and if I don't do this I most probably will not be able to solve it or uh, it will be more problematic and I'm not sure so that that could be a good solution for me if I follow an online training so you get an immediate trigger to start doing that and if you have the trigger then you can move to routine routine is the actual process how it's all organized uh, including the tools technologies and the solution itself the online training itself and uh, then it's not enough. Again, uh, I heard from many people uh, as if they think that just following the training is the ultimate objective. But of course, we should not forget that uh, we are not following these trainings just because of or, or doing learning um, for the sake of learning. We want to probably apply it somewhere. Otherwise, it does not have a lot of sense, at least to me. And probably difficult also for SMEs to convince them themselves to do this if there is no practical impl implementation. So this is the reinforcement point where you apply training to practice. And as a company, you actually make sure that this is relevant and is applied. Otherwise, what's the point, right? And environment, that's the fifth one. Uh, so it has to be sustained. It has to be a, a sustained process when there is this culture, when people do this not on an ad hoc basis, but it's kind of a part of your normal behavior in companies. And everybody's aware, everybody's engaged in learning. Uh, people exchange their experiences. They help each other. They discuss it with each other. Um, and the leadership is supporting this and so on. So these are the five elements. And only when you have all five of them present, 
uh, will the behavior uh, have a chance to be changed. If something is missing, it's probably not going to be a big success uh, from the very beginning. It's already quite clear. Uh, so we took that model to structure the measures that we were collecting from stakeholders. But that was only one part of, of the approach. And we liked it a lot because it's, it's a cyclical, holistic approach uh, showing that uh, organizing learning is much more than just the third element, routine, which is usually um, related to just tools, technologies, and learning solutions themselves. So now if um, we go further, uh, I also have to emphasize that uh, of course, we're talking now about small companies, uh, as if it's one like uh, heterogeneous uh, one uh, homo homogeneous population of uh, companies, but it's not the case. Uh, as we all know, SMEs are so different in terms of size, sector, age, culture. Uh, like high, even high-tech SMEs are different. You know, if you take uh, ICT-related SMEs, they are in a totally different world. You don't have to convince them about online training. Most probably they have been using it for, dec for a decade already at least. But uh, if we talk about other high-tech SMEs, not uh, ICT related, then it's already uh, less popular. And if we go to more traditional sectors, then it's uh, less and less popular. So we have to keep this all in mind when we develop a vision. And uh, that's why uh, it has to be multidimensional. Uh, because um, what we also found, um, when we have to develop solutions, we need to understand that there are lots of actors involved in the process. So we cannot uh, delegate all the solutions to SMEs themselves or to the European Commission only or to su uh, the suppliers of uh, um, education and training uh, solutions. So it has to be um, a complex approach where lots of different actors have a certain role to play. And that brings us finally to the picture of how we structured the vision in four strands, um, which uh, is kind of a, a summarizing the whole idea behind the approach. And that's what I would like to explain to you in detail. Uh, you could see you can see here two axes. Um, one is uh, related to the target group, horizontal one, employers and employees, and another one, motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. And in our research, we found that actually, uh, of course, both need to be targeted, employers and employees. Uh, if you work exclusively with employees but do not get leadership support, then um, employees will not get enough support and opportunities to work, uh, to, to use online training solutions at work. If you work exclusively with employers, then Obviously, you're missing out the end user, the employees who need to be retrained. And in terms of motivations, um, we had lots of discussions whether we have to focus on intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. Um, I hope uh, we all are on the same page just to clarify. So by intrinsic, we mean uh, motivation when people are doing something because uh, it's their own wish, their own desire, because they have some internal personal satisfaction after doing that, like personal growth, because they want really to excel in certain skills. And, and, and extrinsic is related to external rewards. So people are doing something because they will be rewarded for that. Um, and our research has shown that we need both approaches. Uh, and both can be good and uh, sometimes combined. Um, and uh, there is no one best way to do things. So that's why we actually split all the measures that we've collected from different stakeholders into four strands. And we assigned them a certain color. And our first color was blue, which refers to this uh, visionary leadership. And it covers employers with intrinsic motivation and um, re re refers to all the measures that aim to inspire employers, to encourage them to promote online training among their employees and to facilitate uh, those processes and help them exchange experiences, set up all those processes, and so on. If we go uh, below that, so yellow strand refers to the same target group employers, but there we've, we will find measures that aim to reward employers for stimulating online training within their companies. and um, 
we talk here about tax uh, tax measures, labels, SME awards, and so on. Um, then uh, we have a green strand, and that is focusing on uh, intrinsic motivation of employees, uh, which is the most natural way of learning that we have here. It's where people ge genuinely just want to uh, to learn something because they like it, because they want to grow in something, because it's needed for for them. So that's this green strand, and they need to be inspired and uh, facilitated. And then there is this red strand where uh, measures aim at rewarding learning uh, learners for engaging in learning activities. We even have seen suggestions to use monetary rewards, non-monetary recognition, and so on. Uh, we can discuss a lot about which one is good, which one is bad, and um, we had lots of quite hot discussions on that with an overall conclusion that we cannot claim that something is better than the other because they are meant for different target audiences, these types of measures. And in some cases, uh, one measure is, uh, one strand is better. In other cases, it may not be working and so on. Sometimes they could be combined. These, we are still not at the level of specific measures. Uh, this is just um, an overview of dimensions, just to show you how we structured the vision. So you may remember the cycle that I showed you. I'll just uh, go back here. So this cycle uh, of the uh, behavioral change, and now this uh, picture with four colors. So these are our four, or oh, these are two frameworks that we use to structure the measures. And why we had to use frameworks? Because now I will be showing you, please don't try to read this. <laughs> it's not meant for you to be reading this. It's just, but it's it's all available in the report. So it's all, all openly uh, valuable. It's just to show you, uh, so I will be clicking through it quickly, uh, that we have uh, in total, it's something around 50 different measures which were prioritized out of hundreds of solutions which we had to combine, uh, assess, reassess, uh, merge together, and then derive these about 50 measures. So we could not have a list of just 50 measures and say, oh, this is this just huge list, and, and that's what you have to do. We needed to set priorities, and we needed to understand, do we have a full picture or not? So putting it into these dimensions, so in purple, uh, you will see here, uh, this is the framework. So like in, if you see on the left side of the table, we have motor and then there will be a, a trigger, trigger routine and so on. So these are measures structured around the cycle, the habit loop. And on the right side, you will see the colors. And these are the colors of the vision strands. You may remember that we just discussed it. So uh, what we had to do, we had to link each specific measure with a certain point on a cycle uh, of the habit loop model and a certain vision strand. And in some cases, one measure was related to different strands simultaneously. So it could happen as well. And here you can see that in total, uh, we had a similar number of measures uh, for different vision types or different strands. But uh, in terms of priorities, how did we define the top priorities? We had a pan-European pan stakeholder survey again. And uh, uh, we asked uh, the stakeholders, which I already mentioned to you, all those key groups, to nominate their top priorities. And here I will show them to you later on. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate that uh, the strand that gathered the highest number was the blue strand. And that's, you may remember, it's a visionary leadership when leaders of small companies are tackled, are targeted, and are inspired, encouraged, uh, facilitated to exchange experiences. And if we move down to the next point, it's um, so the second place, so to say, it goes to the green strand, uh, which refers to uh, learners in the driver's seat. And you remember this, the most natural way of learning when learners themselves are just genuinely engaged in the learning process because they want it for themselves. And uh, yellow and red uh, received um, um, less priorities, but still they are included in the priority list. So actually this priority check uh, showed us that all four vision strands need to be 
included in the common vision. So they are all valid. Some of them are more relevant to some context than others, but we should not exclude any of them and say that they are not or are wrong, which we had as a question during our debates. And uh, now if we look at the top priority measures, so here they are, you will see them in the brochure, you will find them in the report. Uh, we will uh, not have um, a time to go to um, into each of them in detail, but you can just briefly uh, look at them. So it's uh, basically specific elements that need to be present um, related to different aspects of uh, what we've covered, related to establishing communities of practice, but also so developing multi-stakeholder collaboration platforms, um, things related to personalization, like developing platforms for, uh, with personal learning accounts, uh, personal learning environments, but also, um, for example, things related to recognitions, uh, to, to learning reviews as part of management reviews, and providing spaces for experimentation and innovation. So that was uh, one of the key points that we need at the EU level and national levels. We need some hubs, some spaces where we could try out new approaches, because very often, uh, with these digital technologies, with, with radical changes, um, you do not know what will work and what will not work, and you have to experiment, you have to take risks, you have to try out things uh, before knowing whether it will be working, and it has to be some kind of uh, this um, environment uh, which is valuable to both uh, suppliers, providers of online training, but also for them to engage users and also for users to try out things. So this type of initiatives. Each of those blocks, uh, which you see here, um, is connected to specific uh, suggestions, proposals for projects at the EU and national levels. So we did not stop at just saying, OK, you have to establish communities of practice. OK, uh, well, we all may agree, but what, what needs to be done, and who has to do it, and what kind of projects, and how. So what we did for each of those measures, uh, for these top priority measures, we developed uh, quite specific tables, um, and I will show just an example um, to you. So here, uh, they are all available, again, in the final report, where we also describe so what kind of activities uh, could require dedicated budget. These are examples of activities, of course. The list is not exhaustive. But we show here that it's, for example, a pan-European initiative that needs to be introduced uh, with a specific budget, with a certain duration, and what could be the, the scope of that, then what kind of regional national funds would be needed, and uh, so on. So we did it actually for, yeah, for all of those measures, and um, uh, that's the most important input that we were trying to deliver to the new commission, which I mentioned in the beginning, because the objective was to make sure that uh, we inform them based on the market needs of what uh, the priorities of the new commission should be directed at in the next, uh, so the upcoming period, 21-27, and uh, to give them some food for thought, but also specific suggestions and specific initiatives uh, to consider in the future. And all those initiatives and suggestions, again, were developed based on the inputs collecting, uh, collected from the stakeholders. And just some final remarks from my side. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, what our research um, uh, suggests is that there is a need for uh, learning ecosystems. I think uh, that's a topic that is uh, popping up during pretty much yeah, most of the discussions when you talk about the promotion of online training. Um, it's a complex phenomenon, a complex um, idea that we're talking about, and we cannot deal with it at the level of an individual organization uh, or even a country. It's very often uh, there is a need for this, for joining forces at the level of multiple organizations, countries, and creating these ecosystems in which all key players are included. And a central role is assigned to learners themselves, as I already emphasized. And of course, personalization, uh, we had this discussion again between personal and personalized, which uh, let's not enter right now. It's, uh, so personal learning solutions um, are crucial. 
uh, need to be also part of, of the whole approach and uh, put at the cornerstone. Uh, and uh, then um, the support that needs to be provided to learners needs to be not an odd, at an ad hoc basis, but has to be present during the whole professional career. Yes, so everything should be um, oriented towards this notion of life. All right, so that's it from my side uh, for the presentation part. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'll give the floor back to Ebba, I guess, for moderating the question and answer session. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina. It was a really, really uh, fantastic presentation. Um, I have myself uh, followed this uh, project as an evaluator and um, expert uh, for the, the whole period of time. So we have uh, had many discussions and I think this pro project initiative is extremely useful for the workforce in Europe. So that's why we also wanted to have it as a webinar because we have to, it has been disseminated and uh, all of us need to do our part. Uh, um, what you are suggesting from, from this initiative. So, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, for example, um, one uh, from... Um, uh, you had a slide uh, about uh, the approach, and there was a question from Rickard. Uh, what is the approach an approach to uh, promoting online training or a vision of online training? I need some help to figure out <laughs> what this question is yes, about. Yes, I can maybe go back to the um, uh, slides if I remember where it was. Vision, I think it. Um, mm, let me see. This one. Right. So if I understand it correctly, the question is, is this an approach for or a vision for promoting online training or a vision for online training? Yes. Is that the question? Right. Yes. Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, asking that because I, I really need to make it uh, clear indeed. So the vision is for promoting. So the way the ways of promoting online training. It's not the vision of how online training should look like, but it's the vision of how can we make sure that uh, uh, the online training solutions are actively adopted by companies and especially small companies. In I hope I've answered that. Thank you. Yes, I think that was uh, clear for, for all of us. Uh, let me see. Um, here was another one. Uh, I'm interested in what um, what is understood by online training, like uh, MOOCs, like XMOOCs, or what they're, they're also uh, or and also about community of practices and learning, I mean, learning about by and from communities of practices. Right, and that's what I also tried to address when I showed the definition in the beginning, uh, where I emphasized that we try to talk about online training in the broader sense as um, all kinds of learning that has a digital component component in it, uh, using digital technology. So it's a much broader perspective than just something being purely online. It can be also offline. It can be uh, uh, whatever whatever is digital. And it does not have to be formal training. It can be learning. We actually had a big discussion in the very end of this project when um, one of the steering committee members pointed out that the online training term may not be the best term to use here. And we may even recommend consider using it at all. But since we've been using it, we got it as it is already from the Commission uh, when we started working on the project. And we already presented so many um, times uh, the project itself that we had some kind of brand already established around this initiative. So we thought it could be a bit too dangerous to rebrand it at the very end. So we yes. kept it, but we tried to write. So Abby, you were there as well, yes. indeed. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we had very, very uh, tough discussions about that. <laughs> but I think uh, the, what you have written here on this slide as well, shifting from the digital learning towards le learning in a digital world is very important to emphasize. Um, 
let me see. Uh, Catherine is uh, are saying you have a focus on SMEs. Uh, what differences do you see in uh, promoting online training among uh, academics? All right, that's a great <laughs> question. Thank you so much. Well, um, uh, although we have not focused on academics, but we occasionally heard some opinions from their side as well. And I have to say something really striking was mentioned uh, by uh, uh, some people from, from academia when they said to us, um, actually, uh, in our university, we kind of see that our professors, they try to hide the opportunities of online training from students because they sincerely think that they compete with those online trainings themselves and that they will become uh, not needed anymore you know as as teachers as professors so there is a kind of a, a artificial or not uh, there is a kind of a resistance from uh, professors from teachers side uh, so <laughs> they do not promote it because they think that they they will lose their jobs so yeah. that i think is something which is typical i'm not saying that it's typical for academia because i've seen great universities with lots of digitalization already in place but that's something that we do not have with smes and companies probably because they do not compete with teachers but here you have this too and there was also discussion in the steering committee um, we had about um, that academia need to be more involved in this kind of uh, issues together with smes Absolutely. That is also in your report. Um, I have um, one question for you as well. Um, having presenting all the, um, all your findings and the background and also your visions and recommendations, um, um, what can we do um, to promote uh, open learning in the workforce in Europe uh, from our sides? What, what can each of us do? <laughs> That's a great question. That's actually the central question of the whole initiative. Um, I do not think I can answer it uh, very quickly because it again it depends on uh, which position you are in, uh, um, which stakeholder yeah. group you represent, right? Uh, but uh, there are uh, in our report and in our brochure what we tried we tried to highlight those roles for specific stakeholder groups and uh, try to ha highlight those key directions for action which starts from awareness raising so we all need to work on raising awareness among companies that these tools do exist they are at a quite high level of advancement and become better and better that these solutions become accessible and for actually very often they are even cheaper uh, than uh, traditional training or even for free. Uh, so we need to create this awareness. We need to uh, make sure that uh, these companies know where to go and uh, where to find training, but also that they get assistance with um, implementing it and hopefully also at the stage of developing the training that they get engaged in developing it and making sure that it's relevant to their own needs. And that we also finally, to close the loop, uh, we have to support them with um, sustaining this culture of learning. And I think uh, just to summarizing what I'm, I was trying to say, if we go back to, uh, to the model that I showed, this habit loop model, uh, that's actually what we all need to do. Uh, because that's, you know, all these five elements, these are the elements we all have to work on. And starting from the company, but then at each level it adds up. So um, European Commission needs to work on it from their level, all national yeah. organizations so from their level, and then so on. Yes. And then we will be completing the cycle. Yes, right. We, we need to do the work both on a micro level, meso level, and macro level. And each of us uh, can make a difference for you can get things happen happening. There is actually a final question on um, also by Richard uh, on the second to the last slide. Uh, that, that was why I was moving in your slides. Uh, there was um, a reference uh, on IE um, ecosystem or something similar. Can you give an example? The second, the second last slide. Uh, here it was meant uh, more like, oh yeah, uh, it's here, uh, that uh, yes, AI augmented learning ecosystems and platforms. Uh, it means that uh, we just need to uh, start 
well, we, we increasingly start using AI technologies and all the other digital solutions that are out there to tailor to personalize uh, the content uh, of trainings to the needs of specific users so that, the, yeah, to maximize the relevance. And uh, in terms of examples, um, well, pretty much uh, there are lots of different examples uh, in companies what we've heard for example from IBM was a prominent example but that's of course a big name which uh, small companies can hardly <laughs> replicate on their own uh, but uh, uh, I would say that um, most uh, modern uh, learning platforms then they start already using these AI technologies to make sure that the content is tailored, is monitored, that the user is constantly observed, and it gets the uh, the options uh, that they're most suitable and um, relevant to the user. And so the systems that we will be building in the future, they will be more and more AI enabled. And yes. it's just the beginning of it, but uh, we can hardly imagine what will be possible in a few years time and what kind of solutions AI will be able to generate to us in the end. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what I... Um, so, um, uh, thank you very much again, uh, Christina, for sharing, uh, sharing your insights uh, on this initiative uh, with us. And, um, I, I would really recommend you to take part of the, the, the report. It's really, really useful. And the, the background material, the, um, the desktop research and the interviews and the surveys are, are really, really comprehensive. And your findings and recommendations are so um, so interesting to to deal with and take part of and to to again to disseminate. Uh, we can do do a lot ourselves uh, to make things happening. So thank you all for for being with us uh, for this hour for this webinar. I'm sure there will be a lot of more questions. Uh, so uh, we will have a chat at uh, 6 o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, I will moderate that one. And as I said, I have been involved in this project as well, working with Christina. So I have also some insights in the project, so we can continue the discussion. And um, so 6 o'clock uh, p.m. And uh, the, the hashtag is um, um, Eden Chat. And we have a next webinar coming up on the 26th of February uh, with um, Alfredo Soero, who also is an Eden EC member, and it will be on IE. So you're welcome, and there will be a board announcement from the Eden webpage. So thank you all uh, very much, and thanks a lot to Christina. Thank you very much, also from my side. Thank you. And thanks a lot to the Eden Secretary, who have uh, been, been behind the webinar, doing all the technical things and announcements for this webinar. Thank you especially to Dora. So bye, see you next time. Bye-bye.